Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Monday, May 6th. Things are going to suck <coughs> them in. We're going to get more addiction. Do we really need, do we really need another addiction? Illinois considers legalizing marijuana. A look at the news proposal and its critics. Ready for even more rain? Looking at how local tunnels and reservoirs handled the wettest week in years and what is next. The thing with fair trade is not that people don't support it, it's just that people don't know about it a lot. Young Chicagoans so, uh, joined the fair trade movement and they want you to get on board too. Industrial hemp is a potentially billion dollar industry. Governor Prisker ushers in a new era of hemp farming to the state, which is not the same as its cousin, cannabis. Red Meat Republic, the story of how beef made Chicago and changed America. Trees we have are fire dependent species and they actually like the fact that the fire is here. Sometimes the best thing for a forest or prairie is to burn it. Another look at the day Jay Shevsky spent with the Cook County burn crew. And thousands of electric scooters will soon be rolling into Chicago, but one study points out just how dangerous they can be. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. A one-time terror suspect faces a federal judge. Paris Schutz has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Paris. Phil, a suburban man convicted of attempting to set off a car bomb near a loop bar gets 16 years in prison. A federal judge sentenced 25-year-old Adele Dawood after he admitted to detonating what he thought was a bomb in 2012 in an undercover FBI sting. Prosecutors had asked for 40 years. A federal judge also sentenced Dawood to 45 years of supervised release and credited him with seven years of prison time already served. Waukegan officials are searching for a third victim thought to have died in a factory explosion over the weekend. Officials combed the rubble of the former AB Specialty Silicon factory today after two others were reported dead. Six workers are reported to have made it out alive. The cause of the blast is still unknown and officials say the search could go on for days. Plans for a third Chicago airport in South Suburban Piatone are on the radar once again. Governor Pritzker today said he's open to the idea. This after South Suburban lawmakers, including Congresswoman Robin Kelly, sent Pritzker a letter asking for $150 million in state capital funds for the project. Pritzker says it makes sense if it can be part of a broader economic development plan. I'm looking at all the economic development opportunities. Piatone Airport is certainly one of them. Uh, but there are others, as you know, um, and so we'll continue to look at the capital bill. We'll certainly take into account um, where we can be of help in the south suburbs. Mayor Emanuel had a little smirk there because he has a different view. He says Chicago's O'Hare and Midway airports more than suffice, especially given O'Hare's $8.5 billion expansion plan. Emanuel says the $150 million in state funds can be better spent elsewhere. So to my view is you got $150 million, I got like a lot of schools, libraries and parks to invest. The governor and I, uh, he's responsible for uh, the state of Illinois and its future. I'm responsible for Chicago, the economic engine. Emmanuel and Pritzker made the comments at an event announcing two new companies that are moving into Chicago's redeveloped Old Main Post Office. Anger today at the city's police union for that group's harsh rhetoric against Cook County State's attorney Kim Fox. The Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Oppression held a rally this evening to bash the FOP, claiming its opposition to Fox is race-based. Fox has drawn heat for her handling of the Jussie Smollett case, prompting calls for a special prosecutor to look into it. Protesters today called on the FOP to back down. They even have the nerve to protest the Cook County State's Attorney for dropping charges against a black man who is also a member of the LGBTQIA community after they stood by Jason Van Dyke. An FOP spokesperson responded by quoting Shakespeare, calling the rally a lot of, quote, sound and fury. 
As for the weather, cloudy and showers likely overnight with a, lo a low around 44. And then tomorrow, mostly cloudy and more showers and a high near 50. And now, Phil, back to you. Thank you, Paris. Governor Pritzker campaigned on it, and now he's pushing to follow through on his pledge to legalize marijuana for recreational use. A just introduced measure would let anyone age 21 or older buy and use pot purchased from licensed dispensaries. But there may not be enough lawmakers willing to vote for it. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky is here with an update. Amanda, legislators winding down the spring session. What's the outlook for this proposal on pot? Phil, there has been so much talk about pot over the years, but now it is going to be time for legislators to make up their minds. Pritzker and his allies want a vote by the end of this month. And if their plan does become law, there would be little time wasted. Recreational marijuana would legally be sold and used starting in January. That's just eight months away. Not if Representative Marty Moylan and his allies have their way. Moylan held a press conference today amping up public pressure against the proposal. It's important that we send a message to the state, to the governor. Governor, we need more work on this. This is not a bill that we want. That we we have to protect our children and young adults from this from, from this um, uh, drug and pot and and what it's going to do and affect how it's going to affect all the individuals. Listen, do you want this stuff in your neighborhood? Under the proposal backed by the governor, businesses would have to pay non-refundable permit fees to the state in order to apply for a license to sell or dispense pot for recreational use. Winning them, a fee could reach half a million dollars. Plus, they'd have to pay other fees and taxes. Moylan says businesses aren't going to pony all that money up unless they're certain to make their money back. The way it is proposed now, they're going to have more and more people get addicted. They don't. They want to return on their money. A guy spends a billion dollars. He doesn't want people doing, uh, like I said, beanie babies or, or uh, smoking, uh, eating brownies on the weekend. He wants sustained use. He wants more and more people to use it every day. Listen, they want a return on their money, and that's what they're, they're trying to get, and we're trying to stop it. He's just one legislator. Is that enough to hold up the bill? It's difficult really to gauge just how this bill will fare at this point. I'll try to read the T or... Cannabis leaves, haha, ha, mm. if you will. Earlier this year, Moylan sponsored a resolution calling for his fellow lawmakers to slow down as they look to legalize recreational marijuana. 60 legislators signed on to it. That's enough to kill the bill if they don't change their minds, which the representatives are free to do as that resolution was non binding. And it's likely that some will, particularly Democrats who want to stay on Pritzker's good side. Everyone here is committed to continuing to listen to the members of the General Assembly and our communities during the next several weeks to understand their ideas for improving this measure. Our doors are open. But it took months, years really, of negotiations to get to this point. So it's unclear just how much negotiating room is really left, at least that would make a big enough difference to change people's minds. For example, the governor has previously made clear he wants Illinois' law to allow people to grow marijuana at home. This legislation permits up to five plants as long as they're out of public view. Law enforcement's steadfastly against what's called home grow, so that may be an intractable difference. The proposal was just unveiled over the weekend, what are some of the other major highlights? This bill sets limits on just how much cannabis somebody could legally possess, so 30 grams, but actually it's lower if you are not an Illinois resident, and that's notable because in other states where recreational cannabis has been legalized, tourism has really been a big draw. All of that pot would be taxed, but there aren't yet revenue projections on how much money that would make for Illinois government. Also, anyone in jail or who has a criminal record due to low-level marijuana offenses would see their records expunged. Just how that would work has been another point of contention with law enforcement. Backers say their number one priority in drafting this bill was equity. The communities which have been devastated by the war on drugs are often the very same communities which suffer from a lack of long-term investment and economic opportunity. New jobs and businesses must be created in these communities because that is the only real path to prosperity, community health, and healing. 
To that end, some revenue from the program would be dedicated to grants that would go to minority low-income communities. Also, businesses that compete for those licenses will get extra points on their applications for having an owner that has been arrested or convicted of a low-level marijuana crime, the crime that would be expunged under this bill, and for having owners that live in impacted communities. That may not be enough, however, to satisfy critics who argue that this legislation will actually hurt black and brown neighborhoods by bringing more drugs into them. Amanda, thank you. And now back to Paris Schutz and a look at how Chicago handled the heavy rainfall last week and how the system might deal with more rain this week. Paris. Phil, it's been heavy indeed. We're talking more than five inches of rain around most of the area, the wettest week since 2017. Now, this weather posed a test to the area's new stormwater management systems that have cost hundreds of millions of dollars to construct. So with rain in the forecast for much of the week, how did these systems do and how much more stress might they face? Joining us with more details are Metropolitan Water Reclamation District Commissioner Deborah Shore and Dan Burke, who is the chief engineer for the Chicago Department of Transportation. Welcome both of you to Chicago tonight. Commissioner Shore. Decades in the making, hundreds of millions of dollars. How is the deep tunnel and reservoir system holding up right now? Good news, Paris, it's working. And first, a big shout out and thanks to the dedicated employees and staff of the Water Reclamation District because in the recent storms, we had no reversals to Lake Michigan. That means that the system held more than 11 billion gallons of stormwater overflow in reservoirs and in the tunnel. And we were within inches of having to open gates at Wilmette Harbor to release stormwater overflow to the lake, but we managed not to do that. And the problem with this is it's also sewage that gets released into the lake when this happens, right? That's correct. And Dan Burke, a $70 million Albany Park tunnel project to relieve flooding that's been endemic in the northwest side of Chicago. How is that system holding up? I'm happy to report it, it functioned as designed, worked extremely well. There was no flooding in the Albany Park neighborhood as a result of it, and during peak flow conditions, we were diverting up to 300,000 gallons of water per minute. And as I understand, there was some flooding along Foster Avenue. Can you explain that? Certainly. Downstream, there was some flooding. That, that, that was a um, maintenance-related issue. It was catch basins that were clogged. We um, conveyed that information to our colleagues at the Department of Water Management as quickly addressed and remedied, but nothing to do with the Albany Park stormwater tunnel. All right, Commissioner Shore, let's step back for a second. Explain to all of us how stormwater diversion works in the Chicago region and how these tunnels and reservoirs play a part in that. So first, Paris, you need to think about Chicago is flat. The, we had a glacier here 15,000 years ago, heavy ice that sat upon the landscape, compacted the soils, and as it retreated, left a pretty flat land. So when it rains, there's no real downhill to try to push water away from us. It's going to sit and, on a soggy landscape. What, so over the years, what the Water Reclamation District has done was to dig uh, four sections of a tunnel, deep tunnel, to capture those stormwater overflows from Chicago and 50 of the older suburbs that have combined sewers. So the same pipe running down the middle of the street that captures waste from our homes, from our dishwashers, our showers, our laundry machines, and our toilets, mixes with rainwater that falls down the street drain and has salt and oil and contaminants from the street surface, mixes with sewage, but pipes can only hold so much water and when they fill up, it either is designed to overflow directly into a nearby river or stream. Sometimes, unfortunately, it backs up into our basements. And these are what the reservoirs and the deep tunnels were aimed at solving. Uh, Dan Burke, what about in the city? What is the city's role in capturing stormwater and making sure that basements don't flood? Certainly. I mean, we're the first point of contact for that water. The water is coming out of private homes, businesses, and off the streets into the catch basins and sewer systems, and then it drops at the interceptor level to the MWRD for, for handling from there on out. And Commissioner Shore, you mentioned the fact that it's a combined wastewater and uh, stormwater pipe system. Correct. Chicago is kind of unique in that don't most metropolitan areas separate these two flows into different pipes? 
older cities, many older cities, have combined sewer systems, and it's the more recent development in suburbs and newer cities that have separated their sanitary system from their storm system. And why was it that the Chicago region made the determination to to construct the deep tunnels and reservoirs as opposed to separating the two systems? Well, separating systems is hugely expensive and very disruptive because you have to tear up streets uh, to lay in a second line. So the idea was how can we capture that first flush of rainwater off of the streets that has most of the pollution in it, store it in a deep underground reservoir in effect, and then pumped out water to the treatment plants to be treated when they have the capacity to do so. Dan Burke, we mentioned the Albany Park Tunnel project on the northwest side. Are there similar systems in other parts of Chicago? The Albany Park Tunnel was a unique solution um, spearheaded by Mayor Emanuel. I'm happy to report that it's the only spot in the city where you really you had a river going over a bank and flooding out the surrounding neighborhoods. So in that aspect, it was safe. But there are other places where we have localized flooding issues that need to be addressed. What are those places? Um, they're scattered and they're at various low-lying points throughout the city, but um, again, it's not a it's not a global issue like this was. It's more on, on the micro level. And if you were to advise the incoming mayor, uh, Lori Lightfoot, what would you uh, ask her to focus on? In terms of this, it's conti it's continue down the path around the department of my colleagues, at the Department of Water Management, take this very seriously. They are looking at they are doing a sewer upgrade and replacement program, and they model and look at localized flooding and back up in the basement and they address it through the design and, and um, expansion of the pipes carrying conveying the water to them the BRD. Are there, are there tens hundreds of millions of dollars of investment do you think the city's going to have to make? Well there we're, that investment is happening now there's a, there's a program to upgrade the sewers I believe they do upward of 70 miles a year of sewer main replacement so as part of that they look at where we're, where we have capacity low capacity where there are flooding issues and address those areas first. Commissioner Shore, how much more stress can the deep tunnel and reservoir system face? We mentioned that rain is in the forecast nearly every day in the coming week. That's true, but the big issue is whether it's a soft, steady rain that the system can absorb and has the capacity to manage, or whether it's some of these more intense, highly localized rainstorms, kind of like the ice bucket challenge just turned over in one area. That overwhelms the capacity of the local sewers to even convey that water to the larger interceptors to the deep tunnel. And there's been a lot written about climate change and how it's causing some of these heavier, you know, spotty downpours. Does that pose a threat to the reservoir system? We certainly need to work as much as we can to capture rain where it falls and slow the flow into the system or keep it out altogether. And you mentioned that uh, the gates in Wilmette, uh, you know, that open when the system's overflowed and water and sewage flows out in Lake Michigan, the city's drinking water, um, they've been closed. It's come close. Um, are, they, are they in danger of opening anytime soon if, if this weather pattern continues? I don't think so. The forecast is for not as much rain over the next few days and we've been doing everything we can to lower the levels and give that system more capacity. And you've written about some best practices for storm water management. Give uh, the, the, the Chicago and Cook County residents out there some consumer tips on how to handle the environment like sure. this. Sure, well there are a number of things. One is to remember that because we have combined sewer system any water you're using at home is going to add to that system. So when it's raining, if you can avoid taking a shower or delay it, if you can delay running your dishwasher or your laundry machine, do so. Because then you're keeping that much more water out of the system, giving it a more capacity. In a larger sense, uh, put a rain barrel at the downspouts of your house. Uh, rip up some lawn and, and put in a rain garden or use native plants. Convince your church to put in a permeable parking lot. All techniques to capture rain and recharge our underground water supply and keep it out of the sewers. Dan Burke, how's the city doing in terms of more permeable paving and uh, other infrastructure upgrades that are sort of more environmentally friendly? Happy to report, I think we're doing very well. It's a goal and we've piloted a number of programs. The Department of Transportation 
So again, we've done permeable asphalt. Um, we do infiltration planners on streetscape projects. We look always to, as Commissioner Shore alluded to, to divert that rainwater and create opportunities within the public way to do so. All right, well, we'll have you back once the city dries up from this and perhaps gets soggy again. Commissioner Deborah Shore and Happy to be, come back. Dan Thanks. Burke, thank you both thank for you. being here. You bet. And there's more Chicago tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city. For the free and open exchange of ideas, the City Club of Chicago. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, state officials think that hemp may be Illinois' next billion dollar bumper crop. How the rise of the beef industry helped shape modern America. Jay Shevsky spends the day burning a prairie with a Cook County Forest Preserve burn crew. And get on your electric scooters and ride. A new pilot program hits Chicago streets this summer. But first, the so-called fast fashion industry has exploded in recent years with consumers buying and then discarding more cheap clothes than ever. Also, the fast food industry has put chain fast casual restaurants on just about every corner. But all those cheap options can come with some high costs, such as questionable labor practices and landfills packed to capacity. The consumers targeted most by these young, by these industries are young people, but now some Chicago teens are finding alternatives to fast consumer goods and the fair trade movement. Brandis Friedman has the story. When it comes to fashion and home decor, Maya Westbrook wants everyone to know that fair trade goods can look really good. I think a lot of people have this assumption that it's very like hippy dippy and out of the way and you know it can be stylish and cool and chic and you can have it in your home. The chair over there made out of recycled saris is like my favorite thing ever. I think it's so cool. Westbrook and other Whitney Young High School students led tours of a home full of ethically produced consumer goods like linen, clothing, and decor as part of the 11th annual World Fair Trade Celebration at 4th Presbyterian Church on Michigan Avenue. The fair trade business model ensures workers are given fair wages and safe working conditions while using environmentally sustainable practices. The stylish home is actually 4th Presbyterian's clergy house. It was transformed into a fair trade showplace by the event's organizers, nonprofit Chicago Fair Trade. Westbrook believes when people learn about fair trade, they'll buy fair trade. I used to be somebody who shopped a lot of fast fashion, and I really like clothes. And when I found out about how many child laborers worked in the clothing industry, it you know they were like the same age as me, and it's really frightening to imagine people working in those conditions. And I don't want to put anybody through that inadvertently by supporting companies who support those practices. Earlier this month, Whitney Young became the first fair trade certified school in Chicago, which means they've committed to educating their students about fair trade practices and using fair trade goods in their own operations. Chicago Fair Trade Executive Director Catherine Bissell Cordova says the idea of fair trade naturally resonates with young people. Because we're really trying to build a movement here. And we know that in order to do that, you need youth leaders that are going to carry this on. And you get them when they're young. And they get it, you know? I mean, think about your kids. It's not fair. You hear that constantly. I mean, who doesn't agree that we should be fair? I mean, we've gotten into this real mentality of race to the bottom a lot of times, I think, with um, consumer goods. We all, every single day, eat, drink, put clothing on. And all of these, when we do this, whether we like it or not, we're really impacting the lives of people that we don't know and don't see halfway across the globe. If you don't know where it came from, there's chances are it probably was made somewhere where someone was not paid a good wage. 
In the events marketplace, 13-year-old Evan Robinson is selling pastries made from fair trade ingredients in a pop-up bake shop to benefit organizations that fight human trafficking. A former MasterChef Junior contestant, Robinson says he was inspired to join the fair trade movement after attending a recent conference. A man from UNICEF talked and he just kind of broke my heart because he was talking about human trafficking and how big of a problem it is and how unaddressed it is. And then when Fairtrade presented me with the idea of having uh, a talking, of supporting a charity, uh, then I immediately thought it should go to fight human trafficking both locally and internationally. Robinson convinced five local bakeries to collaborate on recipes and production. As soon as they heard about it and what a great cause it was, they were like, I'm definitely doing that. So Warm Belly Bakery, I created two cookies with them actually, a uh, hot fudge sundae cookie and a salted caramel apple pie cookie. And then from Fat Rice, I have a chocolate banana pear uh, bread with garam masala and smoked salt. So everything, I have a wide variety of things and everything tastes amazing. And if the fair trade pitch doesn't get them to bite, he's got another sweet appeal up his sleeve. No, it's going for charity, so it doesn't count. The calories don't count. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. You can find more information on Chicago Fair Trade on our website. A flood of farmers are hoping hemp will be a cash crop for them this summer. Industrial hemp is a potentially billion dollar industry that Illinois will now take part in. From farming and processing to sales and exports, this will have a massive impact on our state's economy. Farmers across the state can diversify their crops and join a growing industry. It's not legal in Illinois to grow hemp, which is related to cannabis, but is not the same. In the first two days, the Illinois Department of Agriculture began accepting applications to grow and process industrial hemp. A whopping 350 applications came in from farmers who want to start planting this spring. Hemp can be used to make CBD oil, rope, textiles, building materials, and even food. Here to tell us more about Illinois' potential billion dollar crop is Rachel Berry. She is the founder and CEO of the Illinois Hemp Growers Association. She helped lobby for the state's agricultural hemp bill. She and her husband have a small family farm where this summer they will grow hemp on part of it. And Rachel Berry, welcome to Chicago tonight. First of all, as you heard earlier in the show, uh, the state is still debating whether or not to allow recreational cannabis and hemp is related to cannabis, but it's not the same. So let's start with a simple question then. That is, what is the difference between hemp and cannabis? Honestly, time, um, but more basically, um, hemp is the variety of cannabis that is grown for fiber, grain, and flour that's low in CBD, or um, rather low in THC, the psychoactive component in the cannabis plant, the medicinal varieties, um, but is high in THC, which is non-psychoactive and benefits things like seizures, um, let's see, depression, anxiety, um, sleeplessness, all sorts of stuff. Do hemp and cannabis look alike? Yes, they look, um, the flower looks exactly alike, yes, which but, causes some confusion. I see, so, but the difference is that uh, the cannabis uh, cousin of this family of plants uh, has the THC, which as you say is uh, the, the element that makes you high, basically. And hemp does not have that. Uh, you brought in some uh, uh, things to show us made from hemp. And uh, first, let's start with what is this? Uh, what is this pad here? Well, that's a sample of like hemp uh, bass fiber that can be used for insulation or carpet padding or soundproofing. Okay, let's uh, work our way through this. And this? This is like particle board. Um, every part of that is made from hemp, even the glue that holds it together. And uh, in terms of the different uses for it, for example, you, you said this is an alternative to Tyvek. That's right, yes. Uh, bioplastics to wrap housing in. And uh, you can see it has, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty strong. And you even brought, uh, by the way, the blue, um, T-shirt? Yes, correct. The blue T-shirt you're wearing is made out of hemp itself. Uh, what, is that, what does the material feel like next to the skin? It's very soft. In fact, the, the longer you wear it, the more you wear it, the softer it gets. You also have a briefcase, and can you slide it yeah, over here? Of course. And uh, again, this, uh, this is made from hemp? It is made from hemp composite, yes. And it has kind of the same quality in a sense as that uh, Tyvek-like product that, that you brought. So. Um, 
so there are thousands of uses for it. Let's let's uh, let's ag agree to, on that. Yes. Uh, but there are also CBD oils sure. in hemp, and remind people what that is because it seems like everywhere you look, there's uh, there are products that contain CBD in in hand creams and all kinds of things. Uh, remind us what CBD is. Well, CBD again, that's that chemical component in the hemp plant that gives it um, really great nutritional and medicinal val uh, properties and values. Um, yeah, it, it, like I said, it can help with everything from um, minor health issues, sleeplessness, to serious ones like heart disease and seizures. And CBD does not get you high. It does not get you high, no. Is, is that the primary driver right now for farmers? We saw the number of applications, uh, just how high they were. Is that the primary motivation, the fact that uh, there's some there appears to be such a strong demand for the CBD. Yeah, most of the farmers this year, I'd say, are applying to grow CBD, yes. So how can law enforcement or the state or regulators, if these plants look alike and if the flower is identical, how will they know if one is growing cannabis as opposed to hemp? Well, it comes down to education, honestly. The more um, law enforcement and communities understand the differences between hemp and cannabis, the easier things will go. Um, also, you have to be licensed. Um, this is, a, this is a, pro a process that is pretty specific. They want to know where you're growing it. Um, and, you, and again, you have to be licensed to do this. But there's also random testing. Uh, how, how would that work? Well, the Department of Agriculture will help out with that. They're, they'll be along to test the product to make sure that the THC levels aren't going too high in the crop. I see. Uh, Illinois used to be a major hemp producer. What happened? Well, um, the prohibition. Um, we actually, in 1937, nationally hemp was kind of um, shut down in all the states, but it was brought back during World War II. Um, the Polo Hemp Mill in Polo, Illinois was the pilot program that ran from 1943 to 1944, produced lots of rope and textile for the war effort, and um, after the war, our hemp um, stocks came back, we were able to access them, and they shut the hemp plants down. <laughs> uh, you say that hemp is also good for other crops. How is that? Rotation crops, um, it's good for soil. It helps um, take some of the heavy pesticide and herbicide use away from, from, the, from the fields that we spray on. Um, it's also good for the waterways, um, and yeah, it pulls up. It's a it pulls up contaminants out of the soil. Okay, so now there are there are currently 43 states that allow the planting of hemp. Uh, in terms of regulations related to the federal government, is there an issue? Um, there still is with CBD. The FDA still needs to make sure that CBD is being regulated. So uh, CBD, which is the component that does not get you, does Correct. not get a person high. Uh, so you're going to be growing hemp on part of your farm in the summer. What are your plans with it? Is it for food, for CBD? I What's will be growing for CBD this year, yes. But I, I'm looking forward to growing for fiber as the markets kind of open up. Is the long game in fiber, do you think, or is it going to be in CBD for it's, a while? I think it's absolutely in fiber. Um, 25,000 different products that we can make from hemp. It can even conduct and um, hold store electricity. Um, there, there's just a lot of opportunity with fiber. Rachel Burry, thank you so much for, join for joining us. We very much appreciate it. Of course. And back with more right after this. Chicago's connections to the meat processing industry are well known. The city may have been the hog butcher of the world, but our next guest argues it was beef that helped shape not just Chicago, but modern America itself. His book is called Red Meat Republic, 
a hoof to table history of how beef changed America. Here now to tell us that story is author Joshua Specht. Specht teaches history at Monash University in Australia and splits his time between Melbourne and South Bend, Indiana. Did I pronounce the name of the university in Australia correctly? Oh, yes. Monash? Yep, Monash. Oh, okay, very good. So what made you want to write a book about the history of beef in Chicago and in the country generally? Well, I got a piece of advice when I was kind of conceptualizing the project and someone said basically any book you write by the end you're going to be sick of it so <laughs> choose something you're excited about and I had kind of had a long time passion and curiosity about food and I kind of did some research about it and I realized people have written a lot about kind of post-World War II 20th century food feedlots McDonald's people didn't know this 19th century story as well and so I just one of the things you write in the introduction is that America made modern beef at the same time that beef made America modern explain what you mean by that well, what I mean is that, in a sense, first of all, the kind of creation of this, what I call in the book the cattle beef complex, which is the kind of totality of things putting beef on the dinner table, you see all sorts of expansions of federal power in both the American West and across the country. So you see all sorts of wars in the American, we American West with American Indians connected to cattle ranching. You see early federal bureaucracies in terms of regulating meat production. And so you see the state kind of learning what it is as it engages with producing food kind of from hoof to table. Now, as far as kind of um, seeing America in beef, well, I think America kind of created the mold for our modern meat system globally with this idea that you kind of have cheap, as cheap as possible beef in abundant quantities. And that's uh, back to a point you just raised, uh, expand on the connection between uh, the wars with Native Americans and the uh, interest in beef. It may be obvious, but go ahead and, and tell us more. Well, I actually think it's, it's not as obvious. I mean, I think after I've thought about it a bit, it seems obvious, but people didn't really, haven't really written about that part. Often when you talk about food, you kind of take for granted that there's an abundance of land, and you, you write about the railroads that travel the land as opposed to where the land came from. And one of the keys to having the kind of cheap beef we have in the United States is a huge amount of rangeland where once bison had roamed. And there was a system of basically bison in, uh, across the Great Plains, and they were hunted by powerful American Indian polities. And so part of expanding beef production was a process of seizing that land. And cattle were both a tool to do that, a way to use land, as well as a justification, because people basically said, we're putting this land to its best use, which is ranching as opposed to hunting bison. You also talk about uh, the role of federal bureaucracy in this. Uh, what, what came from that? Well, I think, you know, so uh, one of the most powerful kind of bureaucracies of what's known as the progressive era in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was the Bureau of Corporations. And it was basically trying to decide how to make sense of the place of these big businesses in American society that had sort of appeared in the period. And one of the first things they investigated was the beef industry because everybody knows the story of how powerful the railroads are, but the railroads were actually afraid of the Chicago meat packers. And so, kind of, well, because they had, they had been uneasy with getting in business with them, so they kind of made the Chicago meat packers develop their own system of refrigerated rail cars. And soon the Chicago meat packers were so powerful that the railroads had no choice but to take their business. And so, you know, these, these were huge businesses. They were often, they said they weren't colluding, but they in fact probably were. They rarely bid against each other in the union stockyards. And so there were big calls to investigate and regulate them. And so kind of, government investigators kind of cut their teeth in terms of regulating corporations in terms of the meatpacking industry. Give us a couple of beats on the, uh, on the, on the famous uh, meatpacking companies that existed in Chicago. Sure. So in the late 19th century, I like to think of Chicago as a bit like uh, the Silicon Valley of today, huh. which is if you want to go and start a big business, Chicago is an exciting place to be. So two of the most famous meatpackers of the late 19th century, Philip Armour and Gustavus Swift, were kind of Easterners who moved west to seek their fortunes. And so they basically, they get, first they get started as in pork packing, uh, as, as we know, the hog butcher to the world. You can't really do fresh beef on a big scale yet until there's refrigeration technology, but they kind of build up the capacity. And once you get an ability to keep fresh meat chilled from, say, Chicago to New York, all mm. of a sudden there's a huge opportunity. And they just expand massively between the late 1870s and the late 1880s and, and come to control the majority of the nation's meat. And why Chicago? Well... I always like to think of, sh to be a great city, you need two things. You need a good location and a little bit of luck. And Chicago had both. So Chicago, even before there were railroads, was well situated on the Great Lakes, 
but also relatively close to the Mississippi River. So it was a good transportation hub. Then there was a little luck, dirt, well, it, some people were unlucky, but during the American Civil War, the Mississippi River declined as a major avenue of trade. But of course, Chicago seized the opportunity and a sort of north-south orientation for the American economy became east-west from Chicago to New York. Great development. For and uh, you write about this, but tell us about how the beef industry changed Chicago itself. Well, I think it's, first of all, it was part of a general expansion in the size of the city. So the Union Stockyards and Packingtown weren't originally part of the actual city. They were part of the town of Lake. And as the kind of huge amounts of people entered into the stockyards and into Packingtown, the city started to grow kind of towards the south and towards the southwest. Similarly, it became, meatpacking was important to kind of the rise of political and economic power within the city. The private meatpackers were some of the richest Americans of their day and some of the biggest private employers. You talked about the, uh, the rise of the Chicago meat, camp, uh, meat packing companies, uh, and you alluded to this uh, briefly, but expand more on how uh, this was the template for modern agribusiness. Yeah. Um, so there's a bit, I don't think it's, it's necessarily a direct line to what it looks like today, but they kind of figure out the model. And the model is this. You push all the risk and kind of the cost and the burden of raising an animal or growing a crop onto producers, onto relatively small ranchers or farmers. You deal with the living animal for as short a time as possible, and that's what the meat packers realized. They only wanted to deal with cattle while they were alive for, a, for a, you know, a few days. And so this idea that they kind of control the processing, but they don't control any of the kind of risk or unpredictability of nature, that's a model you see mimicked in many agribusinesses today. Why did it end for Chicago? Well, one of the things I talk about in the book is that the meatpacking system is born in specific places like Chicago, but by the end of the story I tell, by the early 20th century, it kind of becomes bigger than any of them, even bigger than Chicago itself, and that's really a consequence of the decline of railroad technology. So once you get trucking, you don't need the kind of centralization, and you move cattle slaughter and processing out to where cattle are raised, cattle are rural animals, Chicago is not a rural place. In terms of how beef uh, and beef production affected the culture of America, you talk about the, uh, you write about some of the intensity of the demand for it, for example. Yeah. Um, well, I like to think of beef as, for, for immigrants coming from Europe, beef went from a kind of special occasion food to an all the time food. So what it meant to people didn't change, but they could get it all the time. And so it became a metric for their success. And so they connected their success in America and in becoming Americans to the ability to have beef in higher and higher qualities all the time. And the funny thing about that is you start to get rich Americans kind of worried because they think, well, you know, are we special anymore? And they, they often complain that, in their words, the common laborer expects the fancy porterhouse steak as opposed to the humble round steak. <laughs> My goodness, jo Joshua Speck. Thank you so much for joining us. Very much appreciate it. Once again, the book is called Red Meat Republic, a hoof to table history of how beef Changed America, and you can read an excerpt on our website. The Cook County Forest Preserves are looking pretty green these days. One reason, of course, is all the recent rain. But another less obvious cause is the district's prescribed burn program. Last month, our own Jay Shevsky fulfilled a longtime dream and spent a day helping a forest preserve burn crew. Here is another look. Have you ever been out in one of the Cook County Forest Preserves and suddenly you enter some kind of magic wonderland? Look closely, those woods are on fire. But the good news is that this fire has been started on purpose and is being carefully managed. In fact, the kind of devastating fires that happen out west could not happen here. Trees we have are fire dependent species and they actually like the fact that the fire is here. Totally different than what happens out west. John McCabe is in charge of the burn program for the forest preserves. He says the burns have a wide variety of benefits, including managing invasive plant species, promoting biological diversity, and improving the health of the soil. That's good there, Chris. The burns happen in spring and fall at sites throughout Cook County. All right. And John has invited me to spend a day working with one of those crews. The day started long before we suited up, with final site selection, a check of weather, and phone calls to alert local authorities about burn locations. 
There will be 11 crews out today burning 24 sites. Each crew has five or six people. For me, they've selected a site at Bussy Woods, so close to their headquarters that we can walk over. All right, good morning. Uh, we have a new face with us today. so we're gonna My burn boss for the day is Elliot Medina. And even though they've burned this site and many others many times, each site and each day's conditions require a different careful plan. Everyone has a job and there is a clear chain of command, critical if anything gets out of hand. Some crew members are assigned to communicate with the public. And some, like me today, will actually start this field on fire using what they call a drip torch. The bike path here acts as a natural fire break. We start by burning a strip alongside it at the downwind end of the site. Even though we have a good break here with the paved bike trail, we're widening that break before we set a more intense fire into this area. That keeps the burn from getting out of control, but it does direct some smoke over the bike path, which they yeah. close as needed. Smoke is the main concern for us. We have all these natural barriers, like a paved bike trail or a road, or somebody's got mowed grass around their house. So the fire, when it hits that, it's gonna put itself out. It's us having to manage that smoke that could jump those barriers and negatively impact the general public. Monica Mueller is an ecologist with the Forest Preserves, she says the burn is especially helpful to native plant species. It really helps to stimulate them and cause them to produce more flowers and more seed. Our prairie plants have deep root systems. They store all their energy underground and are able to come back quickly after burn. In some places, crew members snuff out parts of the fire to keep it from spreading in the wrong direction. We're using water in backpacks. There are also water tanker trucks standing by. And finally, they start what is called the head fire at the upwind end of the site. It will be contained by the wider breaks along the perimeter that we've already created. And soon, what's left is a burnt and smoldering field. So what happens now? Well, at this point, we're just letting the unit burn itself out. Okay. And, uh, it's totally contained, so the fire that's burning on the interior of the unit is surrounded by all black. So we don't have anything to worry oh. about from a security standpoint. But we do need to be here because of the general public out on the trail. If they okay. don't see us, we're gonna call the fire department or something, so we wanna make sure that that doesn't happen. So how long until this comes back? Well, it won't be long, especially since we're in the spring season. I'm suspecting at this site, two to three weeks. The other thing that's- Wait, in two to three weeks, <laughs> this'll be back looking like a prairie. Right, right. And sure enough, we stopped back two weeks later. Not only is it looking pretty green, a coyote wandered by, perhaps to offer its approval. For Chicago Tonight, this is Jay Shevsky. The spring burning season ended in early April and Cook County had its best spring ever, nearly 10,000 acres burned at 169 sites. And by the way, in case you were worried about a rookie like Jay setting fire to your forest preserves, you should know that he did get some training before they handed him a so-called drip torch and that John McCabe, the head of the entire burn program, served as his watchful buddy. If you'd like to give it a try, although though they do make, uh, they do make good use of well-trained volunteers, that is. You can find out more on our website. Chicago is rolling out an electric scooter pilot program this summer, and roughly 3,000 dockless scooters will be available to riders in a designated area covering the west and northwest sides of the city. But on the heels of this new way of getting around is a government study looking at scooter-related injuries in Austin, Texas. Joining us off for his perspective on the uh, upcoming program is John Greenfield. He's editor of Streets Blog Chicago and transportation columnist for the Chicago Reader. John, welcome back to Chicago Night. Good, Good to, to see you, Phil. First of all, what is a dockless electric scooter exactly? Well, it's uh, what's called a micro mobility device. So it's, um, you know, something, it's a way of getting around that basically didn't exist on a widespread basis a year ago. But now they, they're basically ubiquitous in lots of uh, major U.S. cities. Um, you know, it's, it's almost How like... How does it work? We're seeing some... We, we saw somebody uh, using an app, it looked like. 
I was saying, saying today, it's sort of like back in the Jetsons era, that's sort of what people imagined transportation would be like now. It sort of came true. Um, you know, it's, a, it's basically a big skateboard with a uh, handle coming out of it, uh, with a throttle and a brake. Um, and, uh, you know, you can go pretty swift on these things. They go up to 15 miles an hour. Uh, it's, a, it's a fun way to get around. Actually, we're looking at video of, uh, of you and some of our colleagues who were on a Lime scooter earlier today uh, in our parking lot. What did you think of it? Uh, yeah, it's definitely fun. I can definitely see the appeal of, uh, of the scooter for people who aren't interested in riding a bike. I mean, it eliminates some of the barriers to riding a bike for some people. Some people don't want to get exercise when they travel. They don't want to risk getting sweaty. Um, you know, they might find a bike seat uncomfortable. So, uh, you know, a scooter is basically a bicycle for people who don't like bikes. <laughs> <laughs> or who don't want to pedal. Uh, uh, how fast did it go? Uh, they can go up to 15 miles an hour, which is pretty fast. Especially, it, it, feel, like it it's feels very fast. very fast when you're standing upright. You know, it, your center of gravity is high. It's, you know, it definitely feels a little sketchy. Um, yeah, I don't know if you saw that stat that uh, a third of all injuries to scooter, inju scooter users take place during their first trip on a scooter. So I would definitely recommend the first time you get on a scooter, take it easy. Did you feel safe when you were on it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been riding a bike in Chicago for 30 years, and uh, uh, you know, I'm very comfortable with bike handling. And I also had read all the articles about how dangerous scooters can be, so I was pretty cautious. And I did a little bit of experimenting with things like checking out how it handles over potholes and things like that. How did it handle over potholes? Not bad. Um, I was riding one with a bit of suspension, so that probably helped a little bit. Uh, but yeah, you definitely want to keep an eye on the street while you're riding these things, but you also have to keep an eye out for cars, so you've got to multitask a little bit. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's get into the study uh, done in, uh, in Austin. What has been the safety record for these electric scooters? Well, the study that was recently re recently released, uh, it was discussed in an article in Streets Blog USA, our, our sister website. Uh, it was pretty inconclusive. Um, you know, it didn't really answer questions about safety. Uh, the study didn't compare scooter use to other modes like walking and biking in terms of the crash and injury rate. Uh, one thing I can tell you, though, is I was reading an article in Consumer Reports that they tallied that four people died from using electric scooters last year. And in the entire history of US bike share, um, a total of two people died. One of those people, unfortunately, was in Chicago. Uh, but it goes to show that so far, um, scooters have a much worse safety record than bike share. Part of that's probably because, you know, bike share, like the Divi bikes, they're, they're heavy and slow. It's hard to go 15 miles an hour on them if you wanted to. You got the b bigger wheels that bigger might, wheels. might absorb bumps a little. You're really high visibility. They're big blue bikes. Um, you, when you're on a scooter, your profile is very narrow. When you're on a bike, you're much easier to see from the side, so you're less likely to get hit by a driver from the side. Um, uh, bikes have, uh, bike share bikes have built in generator lights, so the lights are always on. So there's all kinds of reasons why, why bike share is safer than scooters. Is there going to be a requirement that a user wear a helmet if he or she is using one of these electric scooters? No, the city of Chicago is not going to require helmets. Um, some, some cities do, like Portland, Oregon. Uh, my opinion is that's a good policy because the helmets are a barrier to use. And also, um, Chicago already has a problem with the police ticketing people in communities so of color. So you're fine with no requirement for helmets? I, I, yeah, that's my preference. Hmm. Um, Chicago has a problem with police uh, using bike enforcement as a way to, as a pretext for doing searches on residents in high crime areas. Um, and I think that would be a risk also if we had a helmet law that the police would use it as a, a pretext for searches. Um, that said, you know, I think a helmet is probably a good idea when you're using a scooter. Like I said, they're faster than the average cyclist and doesn't feel as safe. In terms of uh, it being dockless, where do you put it when you're not using it? Uh, that's another issue. The uh, scooters can theoretically be parked anywhere. The rules that the city of Chicago is setting is that the scooters must be parked in the same way as the bikes are which is namely in the street furniture area of the sidewalk. That is the, the last few feet of the sidewalk before you get to the curb so that they're out of the pedestrian right of way. You can lean them against bike racks. You can lean them against poles. They don't want you leaning them against walls. Um, but that's going to be. Are they going to be locked or you just lean them? 
they the wheels lock themselves. I see. But um, you know, it's fairly easy to pick up these things and throw them in a garbage can, throw them in a fountain. There's a whole Instagram account dedicated to people destroying scooters. So uh, that's what I was going to ask: vandalism yeah. or theft? You know, people say, well, if a lot of scooters get stolen or vandalized, that's just the company's problem. But I don't think Chicago residents should have to deal with scooter eyesores. Um, well, you know, I've been, I've been putting forward a lot of negative talking points about scooters. Do you want to hear some of these potential yeah, absolutely. upsides? <laughs> yes, I, I don't please. want to be a complete crouch <laughs> about it. Okay. So uh, scooters do have the possibility to replace some car trips. Um, they can be really handy for what's called first and last mile trips to and from transit. Um, they can improve transit access, particularly in underserved neighborhoods that have poor transit uh, transit service, you know, infrequent buses or, or not a lot of rapid transit service. Um, they can help fill in the dots there. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I am most excited about as a potential positive thing about scooters is they build a new constituency for car-free lanes. Right now we have bike lanes. Ideally, they're physically protected bike lanes. But every time you want to take a, a mixed traffic lane and convert it to a bike lane, drivers are going to grouse that, you know, there's not that many bicyclists riding in it, but if, if you have scooters combined with bikes, that'll add more political support. And John, as you mentioned, people don't sweat. Thanks That's for, right. Thanks very much. And that is our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. We examine a proposed mega development west of Soldier Field that wants a lot of financial help from the state of Illinois. And a pizzeria filled with antiques gets ready for a highly unusual estate sale. Now for all of us here in Chicago tonight, I'm Phil Ponce and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, serving Chicago as a personal injury law firm since 1984.